This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. On this third Sunday of Easter, we celebrate our risen Savior. So let us now stand and sing together our hymn of praise, number 307 in your hymn book, Christ is Risen, Shout Hosanna. standing as we profess our Christian faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. join me in this responsive reading of Psalm 30 on page 762 in your hymnal. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, Lord, my my God, God, I I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up, my soul from Sheol, restored restored me to life from among those thrown down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment, and the Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hide your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and the Lord I made supplication. 
What profit is there in my death if I go down to praise? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell you of your faithfulness? Hear, O oh Lord, and be gracious to me. O oh Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. May God add God's blessing to the word. Now I invite the children to come forward for a time mostly for children. As we go to God in prayer today, we have uh, celebrations among us. We're several or, uh, celebrating anniversaries and birthdays, and we give God great praise for that. We celebrate all the great things that God is doing among our midst. Here at First Methodist Ashboro, I sent a letter out last week celebrating some of the things we did last year. If you did not receive that letter, just ask the, call the church office and let them know 
and we will get you a letter. But uh, I am, as I sat in uh, sessions last week in California with um, the Reynolds Leadership Academy, I was just overwhelmed about all the good things that are happening here. And to God be the glory. God be the glory indeed. Uh, it is great to see everybody together as we come together to worship God. We have others that on our list that, and our hearts that we want to pray for that need healing, uh, that need uh, God's presence in their life. We want to continue to remember Lisa Rose. She is at home after her surgery, and she is at home now. Continue to pray for Fred McPherson. This is Julia Little's brother at CLAPS. For Pat Harden's uncle, uh, her uncle Ed, who is uh, 87 years old but has pneumonia. We uh, continue to pray for Robin Patton. This is Ryan's uh, brother who is under hospice care. And so we continue to pray for Robin as well. Amy will come and lead us in prayer. Please bow their heads with me. Hear our prayer, O God, as we hear your call. If only the world heard your voice as clearly as Paul did, and if they recognize the truth as we have, but grant us the strength to be your voice in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So we pray for this world, so much violence and no solution, so much that it has been done rightly or wrongly, and a fear and panic that has no solution can be found. So for those who find prejudice a way, as a way of life, for those who are trapped and caught up, we pray for them. For those who have been displaced, we pray. And for those living and making decisions, we pray for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all forms of prejudice, for folk who physically or emotionally build up walls, for those who live with an extreme view of religion, for those who are self-interested, we pray. And for those who live a life beyond what is dehumanizing, we pray for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For ourselves, for those who are family and friends, we, we pray for them. We know um, to pray for those who are ill and recovering, for those who are lonely, anxious, confused, stressed, and for those who bring color back into our life. In the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Jesus calls us to feed his lambs, and to tend to his sheep. Let us show and share his love through the offering of our lives and the offering of our gifts. Let us worship God with God's tithes and our offerings.
You may be seated.
Amen, indeed. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. This is the Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. John. John chapter 21 verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. What a year our state has had in sports. What a year in football. Carolina Panthers fans here today. Some of you. It's okay to raise your hand in church. Uh, Carolina Panther fan. Yes, we almost almost won the Super Bowl. I was coming back from somewhere the night of the Super Bowl and I was in the airport in Charlotte and there was a large crowd gathered around a TV screen there and uh, I knew when I walked up, we did not know, we had just gotten off the plane, uh, we did not know and I could tell by the crowd that it was not good. (laughs) Many Panther fans felt devastated after our loss in the Super Bowl. We came in second place. What a year in basketball. Here we are, Carolina and Duke and NC State and Wake Forest fans, and insert your favorite team there, whatever fan you might be. 
Uh, we've had a great year for men's basketball. Six, I believe six ACC teams were in the Sweet 16. Four ACC teams in the Great Eight. The women's teams this year didn't do as well, um, uh, but they often give us a good run. Syracuse did pretty good in the, in the women's teams, uh, you know, but often our women's teams do well as well, uh, as well. And here we are, some of us diehard Carolina fans, second place today. Some of you asked me if I would wear my Carolina shoes, whether we won or lost last week. You said, will you wear your shoes next week, whether we win or lose? And I'm like, of course. So here they are. Okay. I will admit this is the first time I've ever worn tennis shoes in the pulpit. (laughs) You know, but wow, so close. What a game. I was in California last week, as most of you know, with the Reynolds Academy, with 24 other Methodist clergy. There's 25 of us, and almost all the other Methodist clergy are Duke fans. Uh, Being a Carolina fan and being Methodist clergy is a rare breed. We are a rare breed, (laughs) indeed. Uh, So uh, on... Monday night at the game, we were the few of us, the Carolina fans, uh, Methodist clergy there, we were a few among many. So Monday night, Lori Beth Huffman, many of you know Lori Beth, uh, Tony Ruth Smith and I gathered together, the three clergy uh, UNC fans, we sequestered ourselves away from all the Duke fans who seemed to pull against Carolina, I don't know why, and you know, so we sequestered ourselves and we watched the national championship together and we were yelling and screaming. Uh, we were in uh, my suite and the people underneath us probably thought that they were having another earthquake in California. We were yelling and screaming so much that we couldn't speak the next day. We kept taking each other's pulse, you know. We were, uh, it was great. And when Marcus, the shooting star, hit that three-pointer, and he, you know, I, if I could do it, I would, but I can't. Um, you know, but we jumped for jubilation. We were yelling and screaming. And then, yes, you know it, when Villanova hit that last shot with point eight seconds on the clock uh, we went from up here jubilation yelling and screaming and, and to complete silence laying on the floor we went from jubilation to devastation and we sat there in complete silence for a very long time lamenting unbelievable but what a game What a year. And we came in second place. Yes, second place. But it felt like defeat. It felt like we had lost everything. Peter and the other disciples had been on the mountaintop at the transfiguration with Jesus. They had seen him perform miracles. They sat at his feet when he taught the thousands. They had been in the upper room and experienced intimate love. Then the next three days, they went from jubilation on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, jubilation, a shouting Hosanna to devastation on Good Friday. It seemed like they had lost It was worse than coming in second place. They felt like they had lost everything and they were defeated. Jesus had appeared to the women and to Thomas and the disciples and now things were calming down a bit in Jerusalem. Things were around Jerusalem and the country were sort of going back to normal. Uh, And so Peter looks at his friends, the other disciples, and he says, hey guys, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back to what I used to know to do. He's trying to go back to normal like us Panther and Tar Heel fans. We're trying to go back to normal. But Peter's trying to go back to normal, to what he used to know. And he was um, probably still mulling over the events of the past few weeks. 
He was probably still carrying some of that turmoil in his heart about that whole rooster crowing episode when, you know, he was a little bit confused and he was standing over the fire warming his hands when the servant girl asked him, do you know that man? Do you know that man? Do you know that man? And three times Peter denied. So he needed some normalcy. So he goes back to fishing, back to what he used to do before Jesus called him on the shore just a few years earlier. The other disciples were probably sensing the same and they needed some normalcy, so they followed Peter out to the boat. It was nighttime. Uh, that was the best time to catch fish. They would often fish at night. They were in the boat looking in the waters for fish about 100 yards out. Uh, throwing their nets out and dragging them in, and each time they did not catch one fish. And they do this all night long. Daybreak comes, and they're about to give up. The sun is coming up, and they haven't caught a thing. It seems like going back to normal is not working out too good. But it's not a really a normal day, because there's someone standing on the shore and they're looking uh, at the school of fish on the other side. Often when uh, the disciples and other fishermen at that time would go fishing, they would put someone on the shore to be able to look at the water so that you could uh, point out and say, there's the fish. There they are, you know, come down this way, go that way. I sometimes do that when I'm at the beach with my family and my brother and nephews and my niece are out there fishing and I'm, uh, I'm the spotter in my lounge chair and my sunglasses, and I go, down there, <laughs> go away, down there, <laughs> you know. But that's what they did, they had a spotter to look, and so they look up and they see this man on the shoreline, and uh, they are, uh, they recognize that it's Jesus, they recognize it, and Peter, who is stripped down to his loincloth, uh, or maybe completely naked, back then you don't dress for fishing, some of you may not dress for fishing now, I don't know and I don't want to know, but back then they didn't dress for fishing, and it's not, it's normal. It's very normal for them not to have clothes on while they're out there fishing. And, and Peter sees Jesus and recognizes him. So he grabs his fisherman's tunic and he puts it on and he dives right in the sea. And he swims out to greet Jesus. He gets dressed because for Peter, it's a religious act to greet someone. To be able to greet someone, it's a religious act, so he wanted to be dressed for that. It's an act of hospitality, especially to greet Jesus. So he puts on his tunic, and he dresses for the occasion, and then he goes to have breakfast, to sit down and have breakfast with, with Jesus. Peter might have wanted a normal day, but it was anything but normal. And when he got to the shore and sat down to eat breakfast with Jesus, nothing would ever be normal for Peter again. There he is, warming his hands again over the fire. It had to bring back the memories of that night when he denied Christ. He's standing there warming his hands. And three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter says, of course, Lord, you know that I love you. To sit down with breakfast with Jesus, they are fed more than just fish and bread. To sit down and eat a meal with someone in that time, and I think it's still, we still, uh, at some level, do this today. But to eat it with someone at that time meant that you would enter into covenant with them completely. That whatever they needed, you would do. Whatever you needed, they would do. And so, as they eat the bread and the fish, they eat the bread of life, the sign of the fish. The church realizes the love and, and do, that love and doing is one command. To love is to do. To love is to feed his sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. If you love me, 
tend to my shoe. To love means more than just saying, I love you. Yes, we need to say it. If we've not said that to our family and our friends, we need to say it. We need to say it to those around us. We need to say it to others. But we need to say that we love them. That we need to understand that Jesus is always with us, even when we come in second place. Even when we come in second place. Michael Jordan said it best the other night, I think. When he went into the locker room, there were 51 uh, ex or previous um, UNC basketball players there at the game, I believe. And Michael Jordan and some of, the, of them went in the locker room. But Michael Jordan said it best the other night when he went in the locker room following the, the game and simply said to Marcus and Bryce and Joel and the rest of the team, he said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Often as parents and grandparents, we push and push our children until they're almost neurotic to win, to be the best, to be first, to, to always be the best, to win the championship, even when they come in second place. Second place is not good enough. Second place feels like a failure, like defeat. It being second means that you're in the championship game. There's no failure in that. As parents and grandparents, we often push our children to be first. They would work really hard on their science project. They learn a lot. And when they get second or third place or honorable mention, uh, we say, well, it's okay. There's always next year. When they get to the regionals in baseball and do not make it to the championship game, we tell them, you worked hard this year, uh, but next year, over the summer, we'll work on more on our batting practice, we'll, we'll practice a little harder, and we'll work harder next year, and then we'll make it to the finals. We push our children today to a level that they often forget what it means to just be a kid, just to enjoy life to do their best, whatever their best might be, and to celebrate that, regardless if it's first place or last place, but to celebrate them, doing their best, whatever that is. And then we act ashamed like something is wrong with us when our children uh, you know, don't make the A honor roll. If they've done their best, if they've worked hard and done their best, then it's okay. Our oldest daughter, she came out, um, she was born a natural leader, a natural, uh, she, came, she just started reciting her ABCs when she was like three weeks old, you know. <laughs> just kidding. Um, she uh, always on the a honor roll, she was uh, the top of her class, she received a scholarship to Carolina. She was uh, recognized as a covenant scholar there. She graduated with honors, and the list of awards are very long. She was uh, a star soccer player, captain of the soccer team for four years in high school. And we celebrated that because that is who she is. That is, that is who she is. Our other daughter, she graduated high school, and we were proud of that. She went to community college. She got her degree from UNC Charlotte. Uh, but it was never in her to be the top of the class, although she was more than, uh, you know, she did several times, made the dean's list repeatedly. But her desire was to collect stray cats and to pick up every stray animal along the road. Her, her desire in, in elementary school was to make sure that every kid in the lunch line had lunch money. That, you know, her heart uh, is all about making sure that we stand up for what is right in the world, for those that do not have, that no one is oppressed, that everyone is equal. In preschool, her best friend was a child, Ben, who had Down syndrome, but, and no other kid would play with him. And he was her best friend. We didn't tell her to do that. We encouraged it and we celebrated it. 
We need to celebrate our children for who they are. Not whether they come in first place or win the national championship does not matter. But to celebrate them as long as what they do is for the glory of God. We've told our children, my brother and sister, have told all of our children that you can do and be whatever you want to do and be as long as it glorifies God and God has anointed you for it. Whatever that is. And as long as you get off our paycheck someday. (laughs) When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus responds by saying that love is the greatest commandment. Love is. Love is also the greatest responsibility. Love is not just love. Christian love does not look like what we see on TV. Christian love is much more than that. Love is a responsibility. Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter, who had felt defeated, denied Christ three times, reinstitutes Peter, reinstates him three times here in this text today. He's asking us today, Linda, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Do you love me, Amy? He's asking. Yes, Lord, I love you. He's asking today, John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. He's asking today, Anne, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Do you love me, church? Yes, Lord, we love you. Do you love me, church? Yes, Lord, we love you. Do you love me, church? Yes, Lord, we love you. Then love my people. Love my world that I have created. Love the way that I have taught you to love. Love, no holding back. You can't go back to normal. Your life is not devastated. You're not in second place. You are in my place. Because I love you, so love like no other. Love deeply, and don't be afraid to love. Do you love him? Yes, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you'll take your hymnal and stand as we sing our hymn of response, Lord, you have come to the seashore. We're going to sing all four verses. The last two verses are printed at the bottom. And if you would like to come to the altar today just to say, Yes, Lord, I love you. The altar is open. Let us stand and let us sing.
Jesus said, tend my sheep and feed my lambs. Follow me. To the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. May you go in the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. May it be yours this day and forevermore. Amen.